Hello, this is Dwayne Robinson, uh, CEO of ACE Animation Comics and Entertainment LLC, and you are listening to Nerd by Word. Welcome into the Nerd by Word podcast, a program that is not a creation of our shattered psyche, but an actual tangible form of media in the real world. We're looking at you, Wanda. Chris and Dave are here yet again to guide you through the calamity that is the nerd multiverse. Today, we have a really fantastic interview with independent creator and entrepreneur Dwayne Robinson Jr. of Animation Comics and Entertainment, LLC. But first, we're heading to Wall Street with our senior stock exchange correspondent, Dave. What's happening? Oh, this is funny. I, I like that introduction. I don't even know how to talk about one of the most bonkers news stories of the year so far without an extensive background in the financial market. I'm just going to wing it. That's how I'm going to deal with this. So I don't think it's a secret to anybody that GameStop is dying. You know, video games are moving more and more online. And physical media is becoming less and less important. If GameStop doesn't reinvent itself soon and really fundamentally, it'll probably collapse under the weight of a changing market. And I'm not the only one who thinks so. Several Wall Street traders do too. They've been shortening GameStop's stock, hoping to make a hefty profit. Now, shortening is not something I was horribly familiar with until I started researching the story. But it basically is when you think the price of an asset will go down, so you borrow it uh, from a broker, sell it at the current price. And when the price goes down, you buy it back at the lower price and then return it to the broker you borrowed it from. And the difference is your profit. So far, so normal, or you know, as normal as Wall Street ever gets. On Reddit, however, there's a group called Wall Street Bets, and they like to drive up stock prices of struggling companies by coordinating stock purchases in order to make a profit. And they decided to target GameStop in particular with this little scheme. So Reddit investors bought a ton of GameStop options, and they the short sellers had to buy more and more shares to cover their losing bids. So in short, everybody's suddenly buying GameStop stock, and it drove the value of GameStop up by 1,700%. Now, this has absolutely nothing to do with GameStop. The company is still facing a bleak future. But still, dozens of investors are reaping huge profits off this company right now while the short sellers are desperately trying to stop the bleeding. And to me, this is a really interesting nerd story because A, you know, it's it's video game adjacent, but B, you know, it illustrates that the problems of stock trading in Wall Street, it underlines how coordinated internet efforts are increasingly affecting the quote unquote real world. And I think it reminds everybody that yes, GameStop is is basically about to take its dying breath. Chris, what do you think of the story? This, I mean, this is wild, man. Okay, so in, in addition to GameStop, um, AMC w- was part of this as well. AMC Entertainment, um, and their shares jumped up in value 230%. Um, and this is all very, very recent. So this just happened uh, Wednesday. Um, and then today, like this just happened a few hours ago before we were recording tonight. Um the app Robinhood, which, you know, is popular among, you know, just normal folks that want to buy stocks, um, has limited purchasing shares of GameStop and AMC, if I remember, but I know GameStop. And so now everybody is threatening like class action lawsuits against Robinhood because they're limiting purchasing shares. Um, and then after that happened, the stock prices plummeted again of GameStop. It is just wild. Like it has been nonstop chaos for the last 24 hours. Just look at social media. It's literally ablaze with all of this GameStop talk. But like you hit the nail on the head. It's still on its last leg and headed towards bankruptcy. And the same is true for AMC Entertainment. Like these are these are companies that are 
about to be phased out technologically speaking and um just a bunch it's the power of the internet and social media that are you know just putting it back in you know popular you know culture again so it's just wild to see what what reddit can do but you know uh, i think it's much ado about nothing because you know now they're limiting it and the market seems to have corrected itself i am by far uh by no means a an expert in in financial uh, the financial world. Um, I took AP economics, uh, but that was 15 years ago. And I couldn't tell you a thing that I learned there. Um, but, uh, yeah, this is just wild. And, and, uh, it's just the craziest thing I've seen all week. Yeah, absolutely. And so I just double checked as of recording right now, GameStop stock had a terrible day and started dropping, but it's still closed at the price of $200 a share. And when this whole mess started, it was running at around $20 a share. So it is still <laughs> absolutely bonkers. You know, part of me is tempted to, to offer those shares back to GameStop if I were to have some for about 2 bucks or, or $5 for, for store credit. I like it. I like it. That's about right. Now, Chris, you got a story today that uh, really speaks to my kaiju-loving heart. What have you got? Well, monster fans around the world got their first look at Godzilla vs. Kong as the trailer dropped Sunday uh, and set the internet ablaze. Battle lines were quickly drawn as the hashtags Team Kong and Team Godzilla started trending, and nerds waxed poetic about their theories for the film and their battle strategies. Uh, the release date for the film also did some maneuvering, first from uh, what it was initially in May the 21st, all the way up to March 26th, and then it was pushed back five more days when it finally settled on March the 31st in an effort to capitalize on the Easter holiday and spring break vacations. Now, as part of the Warner Brothers slate of films for 2021, as we covered in a previous Nerd News segment, the Godzilla vs. Kong film will also be released simultaneously in the U.S. on HBO Max on the 31st of March. However, as HBO Max is not available outside the U.S., the foreign theatrical release date is going to remain the 26th. Dave, are you Team Godzilla or Team Kong? Yeah, you know, I'm not going to lie. I've been really excited for this movie for a while, especially based on uh, how Godzilla has been established as this semi-benevolent force of nature in the previous two American Godzilla movies. It's a nice take on the character. I've been a fan of Godzilla nearly all of my life. My father and I frequently enjoyed watching old Toho Godzilla movies together, and I still love the franchise, and I still frequently watch those old Toho movies. Godzilla looms large in my nerd life. I'm really not too fond of the presentation of this trailer exactly for that reason. Well, I'm clearly Team Godzilla, if you couldn't tell. <laughs> I don't really like the reversal implied in this trailer, you know? Uh, after two movies of Godzilla basically being the quote-unquote good guy, my favorite kaiju is now supposed to be the bad guy. And on top of that, I'm supposed to cheer for King Kong to take him down? That's unlikely, guys. The matchup is, of course, silly. I mean, Godzilla is a nuclear-powered ancient monster that has survived two nukes in the past movies, and King Kong is a large ape. I don't think I can believe that Kong hits harder than a nuke. I mean, come on now. At least try to play within the rules you've established in your movies. You know, that being said, I hope this is sort of a Batman versus Superman situation. I mean, not, not the Martha scene necessarily, but maybe the two duke it out only for some other monster to emerge as the real bad guy and the two have to team up. Sort of a classic misunderstanding superhero story. The two monsters fight and then they have to team up at the end. I, I think I would enjoy that a great deal more than what the trailer is hinting at so far, which is that Godzilla somehow just loses it and is the bad guy in this movie. I'm still looking forward to the movie. I just disagree with the whole Kong is the good guy shtick. Wouldn't that be the Mothra scene in, in this case? Save save Mothra? Uh, no. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very much a noob when it comes to, to this realm of, of cinema. Um, I think I watched the 98 Godzilla um, based Ooh, on like the... 
the Puff Daddy music video um, <laughs> and, and the Taco Bell and the Taco Bell. Like, I think my aunt was working at Taco Bell at the time and she brought home a bunch of swag. So like it was constantly in my in my brain. But other than that, I've kind of been, you know, just I, I've never watched any of these, but I'm definitely, definitely intrigued after seeing this. And thankfully, HBO Max has added um, just recently uh, Skull Island and uh, Godzilla King of the Monsters. Now the 2014 Godzilla is not on there, so I'll have to find another way to watch that. But I think I'm I'm gonna have to do a monster verse binge so I can get prepared for this because it's coming soon. You know, March is pretty quick, and and two months sooner than than with what we planned for. Um, then again, like just from the outside looking in as a casual spectator, I, I don't see I'm, I'm kind of along the lines with what you even before talking to you about this, someone who I would consider to be an expert, just looking at them. I would I mean, like he's like a super powered dragon versus, you know, a big gorilla. I mean, it, it doesn't really seem to compare. I've always I've always been a huge fan of, you know, like dragons and you know, large lizards. So it's really amazing that I haven't watched Godzilla stuff. It, it really is weird. But um, I, there was one thing, and you talk about Godzilla being quote unquote the bad guy. There was one line that jumped out to me in the trailer that was like, maybe there's something that we're missing or, or like maybe he's trying to tell us about something that we're missing that really stood out to me. So I'm I'm thinking, I'm, my gut is telling me that, that you're right and that uh, it's going to be like some kind of misunderstanding. I certainly hope so. I think that would make for uh, a, a more satisfying movie for, I think, fans of both. Um, if they have, you know, a sort of a, a mid-movie throwdown and then let the second half of the movie be something a little different. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm still looking forward to this. Anytime Godzilla is on the big screen is good news. And let's be honest, when it comes to kaiju movies, nobody cares about the human stuff. Everybody just wants to see the monsters go at it. So, so I'm 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 ready to see uh, what what happens in this one. All right, you heard it here. We're both Team Godzilla. So, sorry, Kong. Uh, that wraps up our nerd news segment. When we come back from this, our first break, we're going to be sitting down with Dwayne Robinson Jr. of ACE, that's Animation Comics and Entertainment, uh, to talk about all of the projects that they have going on there at their website and and everything that they're doing. Stick around. Welcome back, nerds, to our Byword Big Talk for today. We are sitting down with Animation Comics and Entertainment LLC's Dwayne Robinson Jr. Dwayne, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Glad to be here. So we usually start out our interviews with our guest nerd origin story. So what was your first exposure to like the nerd world and, and how did you get to where you are at today? Um, I would actually say that it's it's, it's different formats. You know, I, I always love watching TV shows and comics and things like that. But uh, I would definitely say uh, TV shows, the Marvel Fox Network, that really kind of just really made me want to kind of try to really start to create my own stories and things of that nature. Even when I had my toys, I instead of just using these toys, whatever toy it could have been, it could have been a Power Ranger. It wasn't a Power Ranger anymore. It was just my own creation, you know, and uh, I was just creating my own world by then since I was a little kid. So it's always been enemy. So uh, tell us a little bit about your company, Animation Comics and Entertainment. What is it that you hope to accomplish with this uh, venture? Well, I think the name is kind of really self-explanatory. But, you know, for, for us, we, we kind of want to uh, really not limit ourselves when it comes to our creativity. And we also uh, want to have other people uh, to, to hire other people with the same kind of uh ideas and, and creativity as well we want to um start out with comics and uh eventually we want to also start to put together um animated series and shows and even hopefully one day a movie that would be nice too you know um and then uh from there also you know because we also do video game and movie reviews so we're also looking to uh expand on that and maybe even one day have a podcast talking about all of these things as a whole so this is a a company that was founded by you and, and Terrence Young in 2017. And in terms of like division of labor, what role does does each of you fill in this venture? Who handles like the creative end? Who handles like the business end? Um, I would say we both create. Uh, we both handle the business end, but uh, when it comes to the day to day aspects, 
Um, that's me. I do that. I'm also the uh, the artist. And I'm also uh, one of the creators of one of the titles that we have currently, which is the Nightfall series, Night, Nightfall Michael's Awakening, along with my brother. He is the one that um, did the, the writing for uh, Salvation, issues zero and one. Now, your, your website uh, is pretty expansive in terms of content. Uh, so you not only feature your own comics, but as you mentioned, you also have film and video game reviews. There's a blog. There's a real extensive shop with merchandise. So just to kind of start picking this apart piece by piece, what got you first interested in, in writing reviews? How did that come about? Um, you know, when it came to writing the reviews aspect, you know, it was always something that my friends used to always ask me when I was uh, talking about a movie or describing it before they had seen it. And they was like, man, you know, you always give like a real detailed uh, explanation on, on what's going on in the story. And, you know, people always was coming to me with that. So, you know, I decided to, to just actually just give my own opinion since everybody seems to have one nowadays, you know. So uh, just really kind of put my own little take on it, you know, because what we do with our reviews is that we don't necessarily give it a rating. We just give you the negatives and the positives. And, you know, we kind of try to stay as neutral as possible. But we do give you, uh, you know, the, like I said, the pros and cons about the story or the video game. Um, and you can make your own idea if uh, you're going to still pick it up, because I feel that uh, there's so many people that do reviews in this day and age. And I think a lot of people base their their own ideas or if they're going to purchase it on these reviews. And I think that's not really kind of what the way to go. If you ask me, I feel that, you know, you should always have your own opinion, your own mind. And, uh, you know, it's nothing wrong to try to use these things as guidelines. But I feel that so many people um, really base their whole opinion on if they if this review is good or bad. And I think at times, you know, it kind of messes up your experience because I can't tell you how many times I've gone to any popular uh, video game or movie of reviewer and they talk about how they didn't like it. And I went to go see it. And I was like, man, what were they talking about? <laughs> I don't see what they see. You know? So that was one of the reasons why we do it that way. And that's going to always continue to be that way. I really wanted to pick up on something you said, Dwayne, which is, you know, that you guys are staying away from like giving it a grade or some kind of like numbered rating or something. It seems like everybody uh, these days when they're looking at entertainment critique is is looking for the, the shortest form of critique. Like, you know, put a number on it, put a grade on it. I want to know without even really reading the review what you thought about it and entertainment i think and entertainment critique is much more complex than something like that so kudos to you for for avoiding that pitfall yeah yeah i i, I just because I, I mean for me like one of the things that i was uh because i'm a huge gamer and uh one of the games that i i still enjoy playing to this day is a game called dynasty wars it's a it's a for the most part a beat em up but every year it used to come out. Every year it used to get bad reviews. And I was like, why? This is this is a game that I enjoy. I know what it is. I'm not expecting it to, you know, change the will. But, I, you know, for what it is, I, I enjoy it thoroughly. And it should be reviewed that way. It should be talked like that. And I think uh, when you don't have those things or you don't have uh, those avenues to really look for those things when you're going to check out a review, per se, it may change your outlook on on purchasing. And I think that loses out on everybody's experience, the people that are making the game and the people that, that can possibly play it and enjoy it. It's, it's really interesting you say that, too. And, and, and where we're in a market where there's so much media out there, there's so many different types of games and, and stories and everything. and it's interesting that you say, like, I don't put a number on it is because I had the same experience with uh, the Avengers game th that was recently released. And, and it was it was dragged like so much by reviews and like because yeah. it wasn't this, it wasn't that it wasn't this. And they I think they put it up like with a, like an unfair or, you know, like inconsequential or erroneous kind of measuring stick because it didn't have what Fortnite has or it doesn't have like the game content that this game has. But I really enjoy the game for what it is. Like, I know what it is, you know, going forward. I don't I don't expect it to be all these other games. And if I want something like that, I'll go to those other games. So I've really, really enjoyed it. I think it had a really strong campaign. I thought the story about Kamala Khan was really beautiful. So I, I really appreciate, like, like you said, like the different kind of take on the review. 
Yeah, I think you have to really kind of, you know, when you're doing a review, you got to remember that there are people out there that are actually going to like the game, regardless of how bad it truly is. There might be some out there that goes, you know, what? I actually like this. This is not bad, you know. So I think you should you should kind of always have a neutral standpoint when it comes to reviews. And that's what we try to do for the Well, what I try to do for the most part, because uh, it is primarily me doing the reviews um, every now and again. I have uh, my other friends do it, too. But um, mainly me. So, so on your merch store, uh, you've got uh, it's filled with shirts featuring your original characters. But there's also a shirt that simply reads "Progression over Perfection." Now, what does that yes. phrase mean to you? And tell us about like the backstory on that. Um, it's, it's not too too long of uh, really explanation. Honestly, it, it was just something because uh, every every Monday, what I do is. Uh, we have something called the Motivational Monday, um, and that's just basically me just uh, posting, you know, something, a quote or something, you know, that can maybe uplift somebody for the week, you know, get everybody prepared for the Monday that's about to, or the week that's about to start, you know. And uh, one day I was scrolling through a few of them trying to find something that really kind of I, I resonated with, and, and that was short and sweet, but it just really resonated with me and it just makes a lot of sense. And to me, you know, it just means that, you know, you can't always have something that you just want to be perfect. Cause I don't believe that there's, that's a, that thing exists. I don't think that word really exists in, in, in so many different things. You know, I think uh, it's okay to, to be happy with what you're doing and enjoy it more than just having out something that is, you know, you're just like, this is perfect. Nothing's wrong because I'm pretty sure there's going to be someone out there that's going to, you know, find something that's wrong with it. And then your whole world is destroyed because of that. You know, you're, 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 you're basing your whole project or whatever you're doing based on it being perfect. And I think uh, at the end of the day, when that is being destroyed or changed and you know, someone sees it differently, it can change your whole outlook and it can make you feel really bad and maybe not even want to go on. So I feel that, you know, don't strive for perfection, you know, just uh, strive to do the best that you can do. That's, that's wonderful. The one the one that's kind of similar to that, that always sticks with me, and I've said this on the podcast before, is uh, Pops from the Luke Cage show on Netflix, where he says, always forward and never backward. And it just kind of resonates. You always right. kind of make some kind of progress. Yeah, I have one that I that I kind of, I don't know if I made it up, but I've never heard anybody say it. I'm not gonna take any type of uh, trademarks anything for it. <laughs> but uh, I have one that I call is uh, slow motion is better than no motion at all. Yeah, that's yeah, that's awesome. You know, and I, I I for me that really makes a lot of sense for me because <clears throat> we started the company at 2017, and uh, when we first started, we were doing good. But then, you know, a lot of personal things, a lot of things got in 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 between what we were trying to do and accomplish, and we had to take a step back. And you know, now we're we're uh, back where we need to be, and we're still driving with uh, finishing uh, Salvation Issue One recently, and we're working on um, finishing Immortal and Brook City. Now, uh, you've mentioned already some of the, the comic book projects that you guys have been working on. Um, let, let's get into the nitty gritty with that. Uh, tell us a little bit about Nightfall, Michael's Awakening. What, what's this comic book all about? And give us a little peek behind the curtain of how, how it came together. Okay. So uh, let, I'll, first I'll start out with the story. So the story is basically about the main character's name is Michael Vash. And he's a, no, a normal college quarterback, and uh, he finds out from his mother that he has uh, something within him, that he actually has a legacy line of werewolves within him. And it kind of, when she tells him, it kind of puts him in a predicament because in the back of his mind, he kind of always felt that she actually might have some type of problems or she might be crazy because of what happens uh, when she first came into the town. The, people dubbed her as the town crazy lady because of so many current events that happened. Um, so he, in the end of the issue, he's kind of conflicted and you kind of realize what happens at the end of it, of the issue. Um, it starts out in black and white and it slowly goes into color. Um, when you read the comic, you'll understand the reasoning behind that. Um, it's actually a, written by me and I did the artwork. 
Um, but the reason why I put together that story was because uh, it was around the time, <laughs> believe it or not, it was around the time when uh, Twilight first came out. And, you know, I, I was all, you know, kind of taken back from that. And I was like, you know, but I knew it wasn't really catered to me. But I felt like, you know, I'll still give it a shot. You know, it, I'm, I'm a huge fan of supernatural stories as a whole, regardless if it's uh, not really catered to me. And I felt like, you know, I might be able to learn something writing wise, you know. Um, and I was just, I just didn't enjoy the story at all. <laughs> I didn't like it. I didn't like, I didn't like the transformation that the werewolf had. He turned into a giant chihuahua and I was just like, no, 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 no. I, you know, I felt like I could do a story that, that has a love story involved and, you know, um, and just kind of do it better, you know, but not also have a certain criteria of people that are arranged, people that I'm trying to, to, to get for. I feel like I could make a story that can resonate with everybody from all different types of ages. Um, but I will be honest that when I first did the story, um, it was a lot darker than what it was. And, you know, that was my that was my kind of um, where I was going with it. I just wanted to make it a dark story, you know, really really, really gritty and dark story, but then I decided to open it up a little bit and, and uh, but still keep the core values of uh, family and what it means to be in a relationship and just have, you know, all these things incorporated within the story. Um, it is still very horror themed, of course, but um, it's a lot lighter than how I had it originally to say the least. No, no, Twilight holds a special place in Dave's heart, if I remember correctly. Oh. <laughs> you know, one of these days, we're just going to have to have a conversation on this pod about my very, very uh, well thought out feelings about Twilight. Uh, they're not they're not horribly <laughs> complex. They come down to it's not very good. But again, uh, like Dwayne said, I don't think I was the target audience either. Um so yeah, anything that that is an alternative to Twilight and and represents you know some werewolves and vampires is good by me. Like I, alternatives to Twilight are a good thing, I think. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't say it's an alternative by any means, but I, I would just say it. Uh, I would say it does it does the horror uh, genre uh, good good thumbs up. It gives it a good thumbs up. It keeps in that same kind of aspect, but it also has a, a very different, um, sort of a modern take, I would say, because, you know, usually when you see or you, you're, you're you're watching a, a werewolf uh, movie or TV show or what have you, it's usually somewhere where it's in a secluded area where, you know, there's not a lot of people. But in this story, it's a very modern story. It takes place in an urban community where there are people and, you know, you can be seen anywhere and everywhere. Um, but you, 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 when you read the comic, you understand why things are the way it is. And it kind of just really slowly starts to build on the world. Um, not in issue one, per se, but mainly in issue two. It explains everything in issue two. It still leaves off a lot of questions, but um, it definitely answers a lot at the same time when it comes to issue two. I would say issue one is more of, you, you know, you're kind of going along with the story. You know, you're growing with the character. You're figuring them out. You're understanding who's who. And then at the end of the issue, you're, you're left with a lot of questions. And then in issue two, it takes off right from there. And then it answers all of those questions that you might have had and even possibly more along with um introducing more characters as well so we'd also love to know more about salvation issue zero what can you tell us about that salvation is uh when we talk about how i actually decided to lighten the story my brother on the other hand did not <laughs> so i would definitely say the uh, salvation story is a lot darker but i would also say that it's darker but it's not um how can i say it's not darker to the point where you know it's it's unreadable for kids Kids can still read it. It's still something that you can probably see, you know, watching Toonami if you're, if you're an anime fan, um, in that type of realm, in that nature. Uh, but I would say the story is uh, about the main character. His name is Vaughn. He is a relic. A relic in that world means that you have a demon and human blood. That's why his eyes are two different colors when you see the cover on issue zero. And he is in search of a powerful shaman that can get his curse mark that he has on his right hand removed. He doesn't know necessarily what and how he got it. He just knows that he was born with it. But he feels that this is definitely a curse mark because he find, he has no true home 
because on one hand, the humans hate him because he has this demon blood and he has these supernatural abilities. And on the other hand, you have the demons who want to kill him for some strange reason that he doesn't have the answers to. And that is why he took the profession at being a demon hunter. So that is pre pretty much what um, Issue Zero, or the actions to say the, the whole story as a whole is really about his journey on trying to get this curse mark removed. And he heard from a, a reliable source in the story that there is a, a shaman named Solomon that can actually possibly get it removed. And you in issue zero, you basically really just finding out who he is as a person. You're seeing the journey that he has to go through to try to get to this this uh, shaman Solomon. And in issue one, it takes up takes continues right off from where that where we left off. Um, it also again adds in more characters, uh, but also answering more questions that you might have had in issue zero. It was also written by my brother. Oh, and I did the artwork. Fantastic. That sounds really, really interesting. Uh, I, I have noticed that both uh, of the series that you've started so far under the ACE banner have a horror vibe featuring, you know, werewolves and demons. Was that a conscious decision? Are, are both of you big fans of the horror genre? Um, I would say we're, we're both fans of all genres as a whole. But um, when we started the company, we really kind of wanted to just look at what might be missing something that we can kind of start and grow into something else because everybody we feel that has uh indie company has uh superhero stories and we too also have our own superhero universe and what have you but we didn't want to just uh start there we kind of wanted to build an audience people know who we are but not we don't want never want to be typecast in any type of genre but we did see that there was a need for horror, you know, and so that was what we kind of wanted to start on. We wanted to uh, test our, our writing and our creativity when it came to that, because we are fans of horror. But, um, you know, we did, we, we uh, generally just wanted to really start it as a comedy, but we felt that comedy would probably people wouldn't take us too seriously if we started as a comedy. So we started with horror. And I've always been a fan of werewolves myself. I have a tattoo of a werewolf on my on my left shoulder. Um, so that was what we decided to go with was was start with the horror themed stuff, and then slowly but surely kind of break away from that. And that's what we decided to do with uh, putting Brook City as our next comic to be available. So speaking of the hero genre, Immortal looks like a fascinating project. Uh, it's about a hero who saves the world that encounters tragedy, mental health issues after this war with the aliens. What inspired that project and, and when can readers expect to get their hands on that first issue? Um, we're still trying to decide if we want to make it into a, a miniseries or if we want to just have it as a continuing story or one shot. But um, we definitely are going to uh, have that released by the end of the year for sure. But uh, that story is actually written by me. Um, and the idea was, you know, there's so many stories that have, you know, the beginning, middle, end, and then that's it. You know, some may have like another sequel to it, but no one really talks about what could possibly be, you know, the life after, so to speak. And that's pretty much what that story is basically built upon. You know, what's the good things and the positives, but what is also the negatives about being immortal? You know, so many people may think that that's a cool thing to have or be, but there could possibly be a lot of negatives in, in, in that story because of the fact that he, he did indeed save the world from this alien invasion and he joined the military to do so, that he's seen a lot of death. And this was a guy that never chose to have any of these things hap, uh, thrust upon him, but he took it in strive and, and he was able to save the world. But not only was he uh, able to save the world, he also has the ability to live forever. So all of his friends, his family, his wives, everybody eventually passed away and he has to deal with that. And he also has to deal with being, you know, in the thick of things, in the front line. And, you know, he experienced having PTSD. And usually when someone has something like that, you know, they can get help and they can slowly recover from it. But it's something that not too many can. It's always kind of with you so to speak 
and uh, or they eventually they they uh, unfortunately they pass away. But for him, he can't. So he has to always deal with that. And and the story he also has to deal with being the person, the celebrity. You know, everybody knows him in the whole world. So he can't really have a day where he just has a bad day. You know, he's always trying to be positive. He's always trying to uh, inspire people, you know, so he's he's has to deal with that too, you know. So these are the things that I kind of wanted to incorporate in the story. Something new, something kind of different, you know. It's also um, a sort of a noir story, but it takes place in the future. Um, I felt like those two genres is something that no one has really tapped into too much, you know. Um, the only one I can really think of when it comes to movies would be something in along the Blade Runner. But this story is is nowhere near that type of uh, story. And mental health as a storytelling, you know, kind of device is a really, really fascinating thing for me because, and you touched on this, it's not like a quick fix type of thing. Mental health is almost like an addiction where you're fighting it. It's a constant battle. So it's always been one of like an interesting storytelling device for me. Yeah. And I've had, I've had a few family members and friends that um, have had this and still deal with it to this day, um, you know, and depression as a whole, you know. I know a lot of people that deal with that too, and it's a very hard and slippery road to to get through. Now, to to lighten things up a little bit, you also have a project in the works called Brook City, which you mentioned already earlier, and on your website is described as an urban comedy. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about this book and and how it kind of feels to try to do comedy, you know, in comic book form as opposed to something like you know a television series or live action? Yeah. That was one of the things that we kind of really kind of struggled with uh, when we were trying to put this that story together, because there's so many scenes in there that we feel uh, needed to be animated, you know, so to speak. And, you know, we do have goals and aspirations on just continuing to make animated series and, and, and stories. Uh, so that was kind of one of the things that we kind of wanted to first bring out was that. But you know, we, we, we felt like this is something that could also be put into comic book form and we did our best to try to uh, keep in those, those lines and, and, you know, the artwork of it, you know. Um, but yeah, the story is basically about uh, the two characters, the two main characters is actually me and my brother. Uh, the design, I should say, but the personality is us, but I would say it's turned to like a thousand. And it's it's just filled with a, a lot of pop culture references and, you know, um, a lot of kids that might have grown up in the 80s plus and moved on, you know, to maybe like 90s and maybe around 30s and 40s. They, they'll understand a lot more of these jokes that, uh, than maybe the young kids will. But uh, we kind of also wanted to put in something that, you know, people can learn and understand from different point of views and, uh, you know, understand and take with them along with just laughing. So the best way that we uh, describe the story is uh, if the boondocks and family guy had a love child, <laughs> that would be what Brook City is because, you know, it, there's a lot of comedy involved. And uh, but at the same time, you know, th there's a lot of times where, you know, you, you can sit back and go, oh, I see where they're going with this. Oh, okay. Okay. I got it. I got it you know, and things like that. So that's that, you know, we really wanted to keep it really light because there's so many stories that we have currently and some stories that we uh, are still working on that are very dark. So we wanted to also, like I said, we don't want to be uh, typecast and known for any type of genre. We want to be known for just making good stories overall. And uh, this is our first step into really kind of showing that by doing a co uh, comedic uh, comic. So in starting your own comics and entertainment company, what would you say have been the biggest challenges that you face so far? Um, I, you know, when we first started, we, we, we had a lot of structure. We had a lot of things put in place to uh, really kind of prepare ourselves for a lot of things that um, might come our way. But I would definitely say this uh, pandemic is something that really kind of made us re-strategize a lot of things, not in a negative way. In, 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 uh, Anyway, I think it just made us kind of really look at all avenues on how to make revenue. You know, when we first started our company, um, we had all of our comics and, and things uh, available through 
you know, third parties, you know, Amazon, Comicology, you name it, we were on it. And, you know, we, we knew that they were going to take out a certain amount of money, you know, uh, for having to put our stuff on their platform. And we didn't have a problem with that because we knew we were still very young. But uh, when the when COVID first started, you know, we we, we rebranded our whole logo and our, our um, things like that. So we were ready kind of geared to, you know, restart and go out there and go to the conventions and really kind of get our names out there again. But uh, when this hit, you know, it kept everything, you know, we had to figure out a way to make some type of new revenue. And uh, the way that we did that was to just completely redo our website and figure out a way where we could have our website, our main source of making some type of revenue digitally. Because when when we go outside, that's a whole different, you know, beast. But um, creating our new website now that we have, everything is basically through us. You know, you can't get it anywhere else. You can get our merchandise, you can get our comics. And we have so many other things that we want to do with the website as a whole. Uh, but not just for us. Uh, one of the things that I, um, I enjoy doing is uh, to bring notice to other indie comics and companies. You know, um, I don't want to just be um, doing everything for me. I want to help someone else or others uh, get get the type of limelight they need and deserve. So uh, that's why I have the website too. So when you create and you subscribe and you create your own profile, not only do you uh, become a subscriber, but you can also promote your own stuff on our profile page. So we're always asking uh, creatives that come on the show, especially from the indie scene, uh, about you know their take on on crowdfunding. Um, particularly, you know, uh, using it as a way of, of getting things going as far as, you know, getting a project out there, but also uh, oftentimes having to compete, compete on crowdfunding sites with more established professionals who also have now begun to turn towards crowdfunding as a way of getting some of their projects out. Just curious what your take is on Kickstarter, Indiegogo, and the like. Yeah, um, we've done a Kickstarter before. Um We've we've looked into doing Indiegogo, and I, I like both. I think uh, it really just depends on um, the need on, on uh, the the money that you need at the moment. Because I think when it comes to uh, Indiegogo, Indiegogo also gives you the idea, you know, the same type of uh, goal setting and, and rewards that you can do on Kickstarter. But the difference is that uh, if your crowdfunding or Indiegogo uh, thing is not successful you still get to keep a certain amount of revenue that you made which is, is positive but I, I do feel that kickstarter is the number one when it comes to crowdfunding so i think uh, if you do have a kickstarter it it really helps uh when it comes to trying to promote promote it and, and get it out there a lot to to everybody because i feel like everybody knows that more than anything especially if you're uh, any creator or you're just a, a inventor this it has so many other avenues outside of uh just indie comics as a whole so you've hinted at it a little bit um as we've gone through the interview but but what do you hope the future holds for your company and where do you see it in five years in five years i hope that we have a lot more uh titles and uh created and people know us uh simply by our names and our and my logo um, but also known to uh, help and give give back to to other creators as well. Um, that's really important to me is to be able to help others. And I also want, like I said, to I also will, um, am looking into signing other writers and artists to to help uh, be be a part of our company as well. Not not just to um, provide for others to do what have you creating comics or animation but also to um possibly be a part of my company to help expand it those things are very important to me yeah that's absolutely fantastic super super interesting 
Uh, he, here's uh, a question that we always like to ask uh, folks when we start winding down the interview, which is just where can people go? What can they do to keep up with you and your company and to support your work? You can find us on our website, Animation Comics ENT, or lots.com. Some people say uh, Animation Comics Scent dot com but it, it's animation comics ent.com where and in there you can find all of our other links our facebook page our instagram our twitter um where we're going to be going on youtube before the year is out uh with a, hopefully a podcast but we're still putting some uh things in place for that but definitely you can find us on our website and like i said all of our links is there too so you can find us there so I mean, this website has it all, nerds. Like you, you can get video game, film reviews, original comic work, merch. Dwayne, thank you so much for stopping by the show today, and thank you so much for your work and and all the success in the future for you and your brother. Thank you, I appreciate it. And uh, you know, because this is our first time, what I usually like to do is to do something a little special uh, for everybody that goes to the website and puts in you guys' names you can actually get 10% off of everything. So that's nerd by word, all caps, and you'll get 10% off of everything in the merchandise store, including a couple. Holy cow. Dave, that's our first promo code. Wow, that is fantastic. We definitely need to pump that up on, on all social media. That is fantastic. Thank you so much, Dwayne. Our listeners are totally going to appreciate that. Thank you. I appreciate the talk. Thanks so much. Have a great one. You too. And that wraps up our Byword Big Talk. Thanks so much to Dwayne for sitting down with us. And and Dave, we got our first freaking promo code. So again, uh, go to their website. It'll it'll be posted in our show notes. Um, and you enter the promo code Nerd by Word, all caps, all together, and you're going to get ten percent off your order. So that's that's pretty incredible. That's awesome, man. Um. Stick around because after this, our final break, we're going to hit you with two more of our patented nerd commendations. Stick around. All right, we're back for our final segment, nerd commendations. Dave, you're headed the sci-fi route and I'm geeked. What you got? Oh my God, man. I just I hardly can contain myself about this nerd commendation i just got caught up with it and it i'm just i don't even know man i'm just so psyched so i finally got caught up on in a comic book series that has completely captivated my imagination not since my first brush with miss marvel have i enjoyed a new character this much i'm talking about far sector written by nk jemison with art by jamal campbell and it's published by dc comics It's a great twist on the DC comic property Green Lantern. Sojourner Joe Mullen is a military veteran and a former cop who receives an experimental Green Lantern ring and the assignment of a lifetime, become the only Green Lantern in the city enduring, a city of billions made up of three different races who have surrendered their emotions in exchange for peace. When she is charged with investigating the first murder in the city in centuries, she's forced to peel back layer after layer of intrigue, of societal rot, of silent suffering. And what is really at the heart of the city enduring problems, that's the mystery. And how can one Green Lantern hope to solve them? Now, here is usually where I would calmly and semi-logically make my case for why the book is so good. I'm not really sure I can do this with Far Sector. I just want to scream, buy this book, fools. It's so, so very good. The very best science fiction, Chris, holds up a mirror to society. It asks us to examine deep questions and packages this reflective nature into cool technology and, and interesting characters. And Far Sector does exactly that. It's simply great science fiction. And Joe is maybe my favorite new character since Miss Marvel. She's so distinct, so fully realized. I'm totally on board with her. The character oozes authenticity. And her design is instantly iconic and recognizable, even among a sea of other Green Lantern characters. And look, I'm not going to lie. I'm the widest cracker in the cupboard. 
But even I can clearly see that a black writer and a black artist create absolute magic on this black character. It is pure authenticity. The writing is sharp, witty, and deep. The book reflects on everything from today's politics, the right to protest, the use of unnecessary force, racial and cultural biases, and so much more. How can a book be this deep, this action-packed, and this funny even, all at the same time? It boggles the mind. And Jamal Campbell's art positively sings the design of Joe's GL suit, but also her off-duty wardrobe, the facial expressions, the appearance of the various alien races, even the city enduring itself, all show what a tour of the force this is. Give this man all the comic books to draw. I sincerely believe Far Sector is one of the finest books on the stands right now. Heck, it could be the best thing that DC is actually putting out on a monthly basis this minute. Issue 9 was just released. Initially, it was announced as a 12-issue maxi-series. And I'm telling you, I'm in love with this book, Chris. I'm in love with it. I'm, I'm so excited about this. Like, I, I'm hooked from the word go. And I think you, you laid it out perfectly. And, and, to, and why I'm drawn to science fiction is because it draws you in with those cool gadgets like lightsabers or, you know, uh, a communicator from Star Trek. All these awesome things that you wish were real. And then in turn, it hooks you with those things. And then in turn, it causes you to look inward and, and the societal criticisms or, or these deep intellectual discussions is it, just amazing. And it's just like a feast for the mind and soul. And, and, and so the, the way you've laid this out there, like I'm, I'm getting mad Star Trek vibes and, and I'm absolutely here for it. And, and, you know, I've always been an advocate. I I'm a proud SJW. I'm a proud advocate for diversity and in, in every aspect I, I loved, you know, Hispanic culture and and that entire way of life that was not my own so much that I made it my career. Like I, I'm I'm very, very passionate about that because when you live in an echo chamber and, and when you have white writers and when you have white artists creating the same things, it gets vanilla, it gets staunch, it gets so cardboard cut out like carbon copy the same but when you branch out and you you reach out to to even female writers in this case as well and 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 black writers and latinx writers and asian writers and and artists as well you get diverse perspectives and you get different stories that would never have been possible if you just had a bunch of white dudes like and so i've always you know i have like my my favorites, favorite characters that I keep coming back to, but I always go out of my way to seek out ta Coates when he started writing Captain America. It's so interesting to have a black man writing about Steve Rogers. Like, that's fascinating. What's his perspective? What's his take on it? Saladin Ahmed, um, a man of Middle Eastern descent, writing about a black Puerto Rican kid from Brooklyn. It's fascinating to me. And, and you know, with, with so much of the art side of things being, you know, heavily from Latin America and, and black artists, it, it's just, I, I just really, really appreciate the background. And I can't wait to pick this book up. I'm telling you, man, you are going to fall in love with Joe. She is such a great character. One of my favorite scenes, and it's almost it almost becomes sort of a theme over a couple of different issues, is her trying alien cuisine. She's like at this this stand. It looks like the equivalent of, you know, uh, the City Enduring's version of like a street meat kind of place. And she tries this soup and she just looks at the cook and she's like, what the bleep is this? <laughs> and then and in the next panel, you see her and she bought like this ginormous container of the stuff because she loves it. I mean, it's just the, her her reactions to things and, and her perspective on the events in the city and everything. She's just she is such a fantastic character and she's so real, instantly real. Um so closely drawn to life it's it's sometimes difficult to believe that this is a fictional character the characterization is just so good my enthusiasm for this book absolutely has no limits chris it is it is one of the finest things i've ever nerd commended on this show that that reminds me uh, of the next generation episode of when uh commander Riker has like this exchange program where he goes onto the klingon ship and he has to eat gah 
for the first time and like it's <laughs> that exact same experience uh of like oh what the fuck is this and then like he he's just like you know hamming it up right there with the klingons eating goth with the best of them <laughs> <laughs> now, Chris, what are you nerd commending this week? It looks like you're going back into the realm of video games this week. Yeah, so those of you who know me well enough know that I'm a huge fan of many things, two of which are Norse mythology, uh, and that's based on my heritage as well. I've always been fascinated. Um, I have Danish on my father's side, so Norse mythology is right there. I love Thor, all of it, um, and the Assassin's Creed franchise. So I was geeked out of my mind when I found out that these two worlds were going to be merged in Assassin's Creed Valhalla. But I did wait for a few weeks to purchase this game for multiple reasons. Debating the new console release. Did I want to upgrade? Did I want to wait it out? Was there even going to be a new console available? Um, waiting for a digital shop, uh, shop sale. I don't pay full price for anything, especially video games. And patiently waiting some reviews so as not to get my hopes dashed. I finally pulled the trigger when they dropped down uh, the deluxe edition to $39.99. Couldn't pass that up. And I have by no means been disappointed. This game is everything that I hoped it would be and more. The game is gorgeous. Some of the best graphics I've seen in video games, even on my little Xbox One S, my little cheap system. And each installment since the quote-unquote reboot of the franchise since Assassin's Creed Origin has just gotten better and better and better in, in almost every feature of the game. Uh, these past three games, Origins uh, in Egypt, Odyssey in Greece, and now Valhalla in, in Northern Europe and, and the UK, have just done a masterful job of, of telling like the story of how we arrived at this Assassin Templar's War. Uh, the prequels done right, who would have thought? And, and even made some massive improvements with the modern day story arcs. You know, we talked about that before. Like when we go to the present day and, and some of the Assassin's Creed games that were, you know, even the best ones, it was like, oh God, can we just go back to, you know, Renaissance Italy, please? Uh, I, I'm done with the modern day. But, but they do, they go, they've gone a long way in, in, in making improvements there, especially with this last one. Um, so I'm just going to give you a bulleted list of my favorite features for the game. Um, the skill tree can be reset at any time during the game at no cost of resources. So you can completely like take a different strategy at any point in the game. Like I'm, I'm at level like 325 right now. And if I wanted to, I could reset all of my skills and go a completely different direction and max out a different set of skills. Gear sets offer great bonuses. Um, this is a really cool thing that I've never seen done before on any video game. Any gear or weapons that you have can be upgraded to the maximum quality, the maximum tier, even the ones you start the game with. So if you get comfortable with a particular weapon, let's say, like uh, at the beginning of the game, you're given your father's uh, axe. And so like it's a special sentimental thing. You can max that out to the highest quality of the game. And I've never really seen that. Usually at the end of the game, you get the best quality stuff and you just you know discard the old stuff. But, but this one, you can you can have both. So you can have like the cool stuff at the end of the game, but you can also upgrade the old stuff up to that same quality. So that was pretty cool. Uh, the masterful storytelling, whoever the writers on here and the voice actors, oh, amazing. Out of this world, knocking it out of the park. Um, and it's truly a fascinating take on the Norse mythos, particularly Odin. Odin is very, very different. You know, you get used to seeing him even in the MCU as like this, you know, beer gut old guy odin is very much like a sneaky like in the shadows type it's a very very different take on odin the voice actor is very quiet whispery it's very mysterious odin is really really cool and it's a, also a really interesting take on faith and spirituality at large like you have the the danes coming with their religion and and their polytheism uh and they're clashing but also, at some in, in some instances, for alliance purposes, they are allying with the the Christian Anglo Saxons. Um, the inclusion of the Sons of Ragnar. I'm a huge fan of Ragnar Lothbrok, uh, the show Vikings, um, and the Sons of Ragnar and the Anglo Saxon Wars. I, I love history, and and this is historical fiction at its finest. Um, they have a completely new way to heal yourself. 
they have rations, which is you just go around gathering mushrooms and berries, and that's you you complete a ration if you collect enough berries and stuff, and then you just hit that anytime in the middle of a fight. You just you know take a mouthful of berries, and and that heals you. You don't have to like run away and hide until like this meter heals you. Uh, the runes that you socket in your gear to to amp them up, they can uh, switch them out anytime at no extra cost. Um, this one's really cool. You have a fully customizable character that can be changed at any point in the game, including your gender. So you can be a female Avor or a male Avor, and you can switch that at any point in the game. Um, and then you can customize your character with like facial tattoos, tattoos all over your body, um, hair color, hairstyle, and my favorite beard. You can customize your beard. So you can go clean shaven, regular length beard, long length beard, braided beard, a la Thor in Endgame. Really great. And it's a truly fascinating mission arc that takes place in Asgard. So like you take this potion and you wake up in this dream world that's Asgard. My only caution with this recommendation, there is a massive, massive, massive bug in Asgard in that arc with the defensive measures bug. And I really screwed the pooch on this one. Make sure you check out walkthrough guides before you start the defensive measures mission, because now I'm stuck until they get a, a reboot. And like, I can't progress any further in that mission arc. So make sure defensive measures, you check that out on, on like walkthrough guides before you start that arc, because now I'm kind of screwed. But other than that, I love this game and I can play every other part of it just fine. You know I love a good open world game, uh, although I really don't have the time right now to play this kind of time sync. This game is definitely on my radar, though, for when, you know, I actually have some time to play again. I do have to admit that Ubisoft open world games always feel a little over long and overstuffed with busy work rather than meaningful side quests. You know, to me, something like Horizon Zero Dawn, yes, I'm on that horse again, nailed side quests. Each one revealed more about the world, its characters, or its lore. Nothing was wasted. Nothing came down to basically uh, fetch this, at least without some kind of interesting payoff. So is Valhalla an overstuffed ball of side quests like some other uh, Ubisoft open world games, or does it manage to do a good job with the relevance of its quests and its overall playing time? It does a little bit of both. There are some that are pretty quick. The thing that I like about it is is some of the side quests that are not all that interesting can be done in like a minute or less. Like, oh, can you carry like this? There's one where like this guy falls off the bridge. Can you carry him back up to the bridge? And that's it. And it took me like a minute. Um, and then there are some that are much more uh, intrusive. And then they like have like a like a paying off like like a foreshadowing type thing. And the thing that I really like about like these recent games, it's, it's like a choose your own adventure story It's like the, the choices that you make early on in the game will have further implications. Like, um, I, I don't want to spoil anything, but just, just basically that, that you, like you choose and, and it has to be pretty quick too. It has like a little timer. You choose one of three lines of dialogue in certain situations and it'll have further implications. Well, it sounds like it's a really good game, and I definitely need a good open world game. So once my schedule opens up a little bit, I think I'm going to be up for this one. All right, nerds, that wraps up another episode of the Nerd by Word podcast. We thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks so much to Dwayne Robinson for hanging out with us. Be sure to check out their webpage and their Instagram page as well and check out their stuff. Super original, super fascinating, super cool. Um, if you're into horror stuff, if you're into like original content, be sure to check that out and use the promo code nerd by word, all caps for 10% off your order. And if you uh, like what you hear on our podcast, please be sure to uh, subscribe. We are available um, on pretty much any podcasting platform. Uh, we are available uh, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube, among many others. You can also find us on Twitter at NerdByWord, uh, as well as Instagram, same uh, at NerdByWord, uh, or individually at that nerd Chris and at that nerd Dave. You can also join us Saturday nights at 10 p.m. Eastern for hashtag Drunk Pete. We finally got Dave. So basically, what it is is if you like to enjoy alcoholic beverages, cool. If you don't, that's cool too. Sometimes I've done it with Pepsi or bottled water. 
basically we just have a set calendar uh, of a Spider-Man adjacent comic. And uh, based on the theme, like this month, we've been doing like WandaVision type stuff with the release of WandaVision and you live tweet a stuff, uh, live tweet a comic and, and just have fun just reacting and, and you know, conversing with other nerds. So that's again, 10, per, uh, 10 p.m., not 10%. I, I'm blinding them <laughs> together again. Uh, 10 p.m. Eastern every Saturday night, hashtag Drunk Pete. You can reach out to either one of us on, on Twitter and it will be happy to be your guide with that and as always stay well and stay nerdy the nerd byword is written and produced by chris and dave two nerds with a love of all things pop culture the podcast features music by al Jimenez and show art by ashery design find us at nerdbyword.com and wherever podcasts are available <laughs>